Hello, and welcome to another episode of First Chapter Friday. My name is Kathy. I'm a librarian at the Children's Library in Palo Alto, and every Friday I read the first chapter of a book that I think you might want to finish. Today's book is called The Friendship War by Andrew Clement. Now, I love all of Andrew Clement's books. I think they're just fantastic. This is his last one, and it will be his last one because unfortunately he did die earlier this year, but it's a good one. When I'm choosing a book, one of the things I look at is what it says on the cover and also what it says on the inside flap. So I want to share those first. On the back of this book, it says, this is war. Okay, that's too dramatic. But no matter what this is called, so far I'm winning and it feels wonderful. Hmm, is that what friendship is about? So, on the inside flap it says, Grace and Ellie have been best friends since second grade. Ellie's always been in the center of things, and Grace is usually happy to be Ellie's sidekick. But what happens when everything changes? This time, it's Grace who suddenly has everyone's attention when she accidentally starts a new fad at school. A fad that has first her class, then her grade, and then the entire school collecting and trading and even fighting over buttons. A fad that might get her in major trouble and could even be the end of Grace and Ellie's friendship because Ellie's not used to being one-upped by anybody. There's only one thing for Grace to do. With the help of Hank, the biggest button collector in the sixth grade, she'll have to figure out a way to end the fad. But once a fad started, can it be stopped? So this book, by the way, is published by Random House. It said it was the newest one by Andrew Clements, and it came out late last year. Chapter One. Flying from Chicago to Boston by myself hasn't been as big a deal as my dad said it was going to be, but nothing ever is. The second I turn on my phone, it dings with three text messages from him. Ding! 1246. Text me as soon as you land. Ding! 1248. Your plane should have landed by now. Ding! 1250. Are you all right? So I text him right away. All good, just landing. Love from Boston. Dad worries. He calls it planning, but it's worrying. Mom worries less because she knows I don't do dumb stuff, not on purpose. My brother Ben knows that too. Actually, Ben understands me pretty well. I understand him totally, which isn't that hard. He's 15, and he mostly thinks about two things, girls and music. Ben's music isn't rock or jazz or rap. It's a marching band which makes his girlfriend hunt tougher than it needs to be. At least that's my theory. It's the whole marching with a clarinet while wearing a cowboy hat thing. However, if it hadn't been for Ben's August band camp, the entire family might be here on the plane with me, and I wouldn't be getting to spend time alone with Grandpa. So hooray for a marching band. And if Dad had been a little less worried, then he and Mom probably wouldn't have got me my own iPhone a couple of weeks ago. So hooray for dads who worry. Grandpa's waiting right at the end of the walkway from the plane, just like Dad told him to be. Hey, Grace, welcome to Boston. Hi, Grandpa, you look great. I'm not saying that to be polite or something. When we all came to Massachusetts last summer, it was for Grandma's funeral. And back then, Grandpa seemed way too thin and old. He looks much better now, and when we hug, I can tell he's not so skinny anymore. The flight attendant in charge of me looks at Grandpa's driver's license. After he signs a form, we're on the move, me with my backpack and him pulling my suitcase. Anything at the baggage claim? Nope. Good. So, we're headed for Central Parking, uh, unless you're hungry. Dad loaded me up with tons of food. I could survive on the leftovers for weeks. <laughs> That's my son, the Eagle Scout. Once an eagle, always an eagle. Then he says, Hey, did you see that link I sent you about how they're making jet fuel out of vegetable oil? Yeah, I love that. Of all the people in the world, 
I think Grandpa understands me best. He's a real estate agent, but he likes math and science almost as much as I do. Last week, we swapped texts while we watched an episode of Nova, and for years he's been emailing me links to friends he finds online, like the article about robots that can travel through space, and they can keep building new copies of themselves, and they do that for thousands of years until the whole galaxy gets explored. Except, I can't prove that Grandpa is really into that science stuff. He might be making himself like it because he knows that I like it. Either way, it's pretty great. At the car, Grandpa loads my gear into the truck. How about you lean back and take a nap? When we get to Burnham, I'll wake you up for some ice cream. And I've got a surprise for you, too. A surprise? What? Uh -huh, not telling. Well, can the surprise come first before the ice cream? That gets a chuckle. Excellent idea. It's so good to hear Grandpa laugh. We get going, but I don't want to sleep. I want to stay awake and talk especially about Grandma. Except it might be too soon for him to talk about her. It's still kind of soon for me, too. During third and fourth grades, I called her a couple of times every week, and she just let me talk and talk. I could call her about anything or about nothing, and if I ran out of stuff to say, she always had something new to tell me, especially about her garden and all the plants and insects and animals. If Grandma hadn't been so great at describing every little thing she loved, no way would I have gotten into science like I have. Anyway, I know we both miss her, which must be a lot different for Grandpa than it is for me. He knew her for so much longer. Compared to him, maybe I hardly knew her at all. It'd be nice to talk, but I got up at 5.30 this morning, and I stayed awake to watch a movie on the plane. Once we reached the highway... The humming tires wipe me out. Where are we? I blink and look around, and I remember. The road into Burnham is up near the New Hampshire border, and it winds through hills covered with pine and maple trees. We pass old farmhouses, most of them white, with green or black shutters. There are two apple orchards, then corn and pumpkin fields surrounded by stone walls. Land in Illinois doesn't look like this. The air feels different, too. Less humid, sort of crisp, even in the last week of August. Grandpa explained once how the soil here is so rocky that it can't hold moisture the way it does in Illinois. And that got us started on learning about the North American glaciers during the last ice age. We get to the town center, and Grandpa says, Shut your eyes. Don't peek until I say. So I close my eyes. And then I pretend I've been kidnapped and blindfolded, which is probably a weird thing to do, but it makes my observations seem like they matter. I feel the car go straight, and I slow count to 30 before we stop. Maybe a traffic light? No, a stop sign, because we move ahead, then stop. Move ahead, stop. And the turn signal is clicking. Okay, so we went 30 seconds at about 30 miles an hour. I do the math, and since going 16 miles an hour means traveling one mile per minute, going 30 miles an hour means going half a mile per minute. And we traveled half a minute, so we went about one quarter of a mile, which is what I'll tell the police when I call them with the phone that I cleverly hid in my left sock so they can figure out how to track the kidnappers and rescue me. The car turns left, and I count up to 115 before we slow to a stop, and I hear the turn signal again. It's almost two minutes at 30 miles per hour, which is one mile. Then it's a sharp right, some bumps and squeaks, and a full stop. Okay, open your eyes now. I'm looking at a gravel parking lot full of tall weeds, and we're next to a long brick building. Up near the roof, there's a painted sign with faded letters, Burnham Mills. I bought this whole place just last week. Isn't it great? Grandpa sounds like Ben after he got his new clarinet. Yeah, it's great. And there's a lot of zip in my voice because I can tell he wants me to love it. But as I'm snapping pictures from my phone, all I'm seeing is a good spot to make a zombie movie or hide a kidnapped girl. The windows on the second floor of the building are boarded up. The second and third floor windows are mostly broken and the brick walls are covered with graffiti. 
Cracked granite steps lead up to gray marble doors held shut by a rusted chain and a padlock. I love this place. It cost me almost nothing, and by next year, the first floor will be full of nice little shops with a beautiful offices and Riverview condos up here. Before you go home, I'm going to give you the grand tour. But let's head back to Main Street and get that ice cream. It's funny, but I can't remember Grandpa ever doing something like this before. I thought that he just helped other people buy and sell properties. And part of me wonders if he'd be tackling a project like this if Grandma were here. I tell myself that this is scientific curiosity, but I know I'm just being noisy. A day at the ocean, a day climbing Mount Monad Nuck, a morning hike around Boston, and an afternoon at the Museum of Science. Grandpa is definitely back, and that makes me feel happy. We've been walking so much that I'm feeling like I'll need a vacation from my vacation. The day before I fly home, we're on the front steps of Grandpa's old building late in the afternoon. He really wants to take me inside the place. Here, put this on. And he hands me an orange hard hat with a headlamp. It's dark in there? Scientifically, I understand that darkness isn't an actual condition. Light is actual, and darkness just means no light. Still, I'm not a fan. It's not dark everywhere, only where the windows are barred up, and in the stairwells, and down in the basement. He has about ten different keys on a string, and he's trying to find the one for the padlock on the door. The mill was built in 1849, and along the backside, that's the Ketshaw River. The river turned a huge paddle wheel to make the power. First, it was a carpet mill, then a woolen blanket mill, a cotton mill, a shoe factory, and finally a men's and women's clothing factory, which went out of business in 1946. After that, a printer and some small businesses and artists rented space, but it's been empty for almost 15 years, which is why it was so cheap. I'm thinking it would be fine if we just look around the outside of the building, but Grandpa gets the lock open and then hands me a canvas shopping bag. What's this for? In case you find something interesting, you can keep whatever you'd like. Really? Anything? Yep, I'm in the building and everything in it. I follow him inside, and I'm using my phone, sometimes as an extra flashlight, sometimes as a camera. Right now, I realize that this treasure hunt is why Grandpa wanted me to take the grand tour. He knows I love finding stuff, and the old mill is like a gold mine. The first thing I discover is a solid brass doorknob just lying on the floor inside the mill office. Then I find two wooden bobbins loaded with red and green yarn, then a giant pair of scissors, a tin box of sewing needles, an iron gear that weighs about five pounds, two old-fashioned fountain pens, a silver thimble, a key ring with nine brass keys, a hammer with a big flat head, and a pair of antique glasses, a kind that pinch onto the nose. After an hour, I feel like I've barely started, but we've got a dinner reservation at Grandpa's favorite seafood place, so I'm trying to see the whole building before time runs out. It's after five o'clock, and we're up on the third floor, and it's bright and sunny with sparrows and pigeons flying in and out of the broken windows. There's not much to see. About 20 large wooden tables bolted to the floor and some rusty sewing machines next to the windows. I'm watching where I step. Bird droppings. I pointed the doorway on the far wall. Where does that go? Let's look. It's locked. So Grandpa gets out his keys and it takes five tries to find the right one. I turn on my headlamp and pull the door open. It's a small storage room. Wooden shelves loaded with cardboard boxes. <clears throat> each one about a foot high and a foot wide. I brush off some dust and spider webs and carry a box out into the daylight of the large room. It's heavy. The paper ceiling tape tears away easily, and inside? Buttons. Plain, dark gray buttons, each a little smaller than a dime. I shove my hand deep into the box, grab sun, and pull them up to look, just like the ones on top. I bring out another box and open it, and then a third. Nothing but more of the same. Grandpa says, that's a lot of great buttons. Must be about 30 boxes. And it's okay if I take some of these, right? <laughs> like I said, you can keep whatever you want. I scoop two handfuls into my bag, 
and stop. But really, Grandpa, I'd like to have all of them. He points at the shells. All of them? Yes, please. <laughs> what in the world are you going to do with that many buttons? I don't know, but I still want them, if it's okay. Now he's laughing. <laughs> sure, why not? Take them all. Then he looks over at the shells again, thinking. It might be a week or so before I can get them shipped, but the boxes should fit onto one pallet. And since you are my one and only granddaughter, I will make it happen. I just wish I could see there to see the look on your mom's face when the load arrives in Illinois. Latching onto these buttons? It's not weird. Not for me. And Grandpa knows that. And he knows Mom will understand, too. After all, she's the one who stops the car whenever I spot a garage sale. And Grandma, she would have clapped her hands and said, Perfect! Grandpa has seen my room at home and how the drawers of my desk are crammed full. Also, the top of my dresser and the tops of my bookcases and the windowsills. Actually, every flat surface in my room is loaded, including the floor. Feathers, acorns, a really old calculator, Seashells, troll dolls, fake jewelry, rocks and stones, keys, markers and pens, coins, pine cones, paper clips, candles from my birthday cakes, every card and letter I've ever gotten, old movie tickets, marbles, snails, nails rather, on and on. And that's just the smaller stuff. I've also got seven large snow globes, nine dark blue glass bottles, a globe of the world from 1941, a slide rule in its own leather case, three plastic crates of vinyl records, a wobbly piano stool, and a couple dozen stuffed animal toys, mostly cats and dogs and penguins. Not to mention half a zillion paperbacks and comic books. Plus, three full sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which I stack up into the shape of a big armchair. I have a theory about why I collect so many things, which I don't want to think about now. Actually, I've got at least six, five or six active theories rolling around inside my head. Theories about all kinds of stuff. Because whenever I notice something I don't understand, I think up a possible way to explain it. And then I keep track of the facts to test if my theory is right. Which is not some new process I invented. It's called the scientific method. Still, Wanting to hone a whole storeroom of buttons? I might need to revise my theory about why I love all the things in my room. But I'm not lying to Grandpa, and I really don't know why I want all of them. I just do. It feels like an opportunity I shouldn't pass up. Like when I found that third set of Encyclopedia Britannica. And Grandpa gets that. He's still chuckling and shaking his head. I look him in the face. Can I ask a favor? He wipes his eyes with a tissue. Sure. When I get home and I tell Mom and Dad and Ben about your building and everything, I'm not going to tell them about the buttons. Not till they arrive. So could you not mention them until later? <laughs> no problem. That's even better. He's laughing again. Grandpa probably thinks I'm going to keep those buttons a complete secret until they show up in Illinois. But that's not quite true. I'm going to tell one other person in exactly six days on the first day of school. And that's the end of the chapter one of The Friendship War. So it's interesting. It, it isn't as much of a war as you might think. And how it plays out is, is an interesting read. I think you can enjoy it a lot. Um, if you haven't read other books by Andrew Clements, I love them all. But the two favorites that I would recommend after you read this one would be No Talking, where a class suddenly decides they're not going to talk at all. And Frindle, where a young gentleman comes up with a new name for something and how that takes off. Both really good books. So I hope you do go finish this one. And stay tuned because I'll be back next Friday with another First Chapter Friday. Oh, by the way, if you're watching this in the summer, don't forget to sign up for summer reading. It's for everybody and you win a prize. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.